Okay, not only does this thing have a flashing check engine light, but it runs terrible. Today we have a 2015 GTI with just under 100,000 miles. A buddy of mine bought this car for $4,000 knowing that it had a check engine light and ran poorly. Since the check engine light is flashing, we know the car is misfiring. That could be as simple as a spark plug or end up being catastrophic engine failure. So in this video, we're gonna diagnose what's wrong with it, and we might even mess around and fix it. One of our first steps is going to be scanning the car and seeing what faults we have stored. While that's scanning, I'm gonna do a visual inspection, see if we have any glaring issues causing our problems. First thing I'm noticing is this PCV valve looks brand new, maybe irrelevant, but we'll wanna keep that in mind. Also, when you're taking these coils off on the Mark 7, you need the little skinny wrench like this. This one's from Paul at ShopDap to counter hold Otherwise, you're gonna spin this nut when you go to take it off and you're gonna rip the ground strap off There are a few common causes of misfires on this engine again coils are always common Volkswagen thing all the way up to some real true engine sadness So we're gonna go through the steps and figure out Exactly what's wrong with it. You don't want to go move in too many things at one time So if we move the coil and the spark plug at the same time if it doesn't move we know we got cylinder one However, if it does you don't know which one did it so we're just gonna move coils first. Sad, sad floppy cover. We'll go into engine. Cylinder disabling happens when we have like a dead misfire, so that makes sense. Injector cylinder one, injector cylinder three, injector cylinder four, injector cylinder two. We have a lot of faults. Cylinder one misfire. That's what I'm looking for. And the thing that stands out to me here is that everything is cold. Likely that means that this happened after the car sat, started it up, idle high, and it started misfiring pretty quick. Is that our number of misfires is 216 on cylinder one, one misfire on two, one misfire on three, two misfires on four. Obviously to me, that says cylinder one is our problem. The first step that most people do when they have a misfire and they don't have a bunch of test equipment, it's gonna be swapping coils or swapping plugs. I think I'm gonna swap the coil from cylinder one to cylinder two and cylinder two to cylinder one. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I had my suspicions that that was gonna happen, which was nothing. Our misfire didn't move. Our coil is not the problem causing this misfire. We'll pull the spark plug and take a look at it. So we have an NGK plug, which likely is the correct one. Actually looks pretty new. Now we have a choice here. We can swap spark plugs, but what I think I'm gonna do before that is I'm just gonna look my pretty little face down here. The reason I'm doing that is because I can smell fuel, like stanky stank fuel. Maybe we have a bad injector. Let's get the bore scope. Give us a little bit of a looky-see down in our cylinder. Look at how wet it is in there. And it does smell like that's fuel. You can see it actually right there. Looks like there might be some scoring on the cylinder wall. Okay, so I don't see anything very glaringly obvious, no cracked in half piston or anything like that. Since I have that tiny little puddle of fuel though, I wanna see if our injector is stuck open. What I'm gonna do is put our bore scope down and I'm gonna go turn the key on and we're gonna watch what happens. If our injector is stuck open, that 40 or so bar of fuel pressure on the backside of it is gonna go into the cylinder. So we'll know, it'll be really, really obvious. It looks like nothing happened. So we're gonna chalk the injector into the it's probably good category. Let's do a compression test, see what our cylinder one compression looks like. This gets threaded into where the spark plug goes. These guys get hooked together. We crank the car and monitor this gauge. This will show us how much compression that individual cylinder will make. Basically, how tight the cylinder is sealing. So we're gonna check one, cause that's our problem cylinder. It's really smart to just check all four, but at minimum, you need to check at least two different cylinders, unless that one's zero. Then I guess we're, we're toast anyway. Yawn, here we go. <laughs> that's a big old fat zero compression. Let's check cylinder two. That's what it should be, not zero. The right next step is likely going to be a cylinder leak down test. And that's that into... <laughs> okay, we're gonna back up. I found the problem. As I was gearing up to do our cylinder leak down test, I found something really, really interesting. Initially, I put the bore scope down in the cylinder to see if any valves were open so we could identify our compression stroke. I saw an intake valve open, so I thought, hey, cool, we're on the intake stroke. Just to confirm that our valves were closed, I dropped the bore scope back down in, and lo and behold, we still have a valve open. Not only do we have an intake valve open, but we only have one intake valve open, and the other one is closed, which means we have top end problems. Because it's the very first valve, I think pulling this cover probably makes the most sense because with this cover off, we should be able to see the valve, rocker, spring, and all that. That exposes our rocker, and I am 
pretty sure we have a broken valve spring. Well, after getting our upper cover off and getting our bore scope down there, we have 100% confirmed we have a broken valve spring on that very first intake valve. You can see the spring woggling all over the place. This is repairable in the car. It should be repairable without taking the cylinder head off and then we'll get some parts on order and we're gonna fix it. And magically, just like that, our parts have arrived and laid themselves out in a beautiful manner on our workbench. As you can see, this is a ton of stuff and since we're going this deep on a car with 100,000 miles, we are also going to put timing chains on it. It's a big job, so let's get going. We're gonna start by taking the air box and the ducting out. God, it's so dirty in there. I'm gonna get the battery out of the way. Next, I'm going to deal with all of these wires all the way from the stuff over here at the oil filter to the coils, cam adjusters. We have this whole big mamma jamma here. We can take all our wires and just flobble them over to the side. That was just a small part of what we have to do though. So there's still a lot more. Next up, we're gonna get all of our coolant lines out of the way, and I'm just gonna pull a little bit out of the reservoir so it doesn't make quite as much mess all over the top of our engine, like what happened in the water pump video. If you're doing this job, you need to be really careful with this metal coolant line because it'll get it all out of whack and you could kink it. Now we got two T30s up front. This is the area where you do a lot of leaning. You don't wanna lean on something and just break it, so. No big deal. I'm not gonna undo the fuel line, I don't think. I think I'm just gonna unbolt it. Fuel soaked glove now. Let me take this guy. It's okay if it falls, as long as it hits the ground. That can pump super easy. Barely an inconvenience. There we go. Oh, juicy, oh no. We are well on our way. Let's get this upper timing cover back off. Now we already took it off once, so to be honest, it's not all the way on. There we go. Now our spool valves come off first. When you pull this off, make sure you look in this filter and that it's not full of any debris or as I like to say, any sadness. Same thing on the exhaust side. We're gonna treat this bridge real nice. We're gonna crack all the bolts loose. You probably already know that these bolts are one-time use. Now we can pull this bridge off. It's nice and gentle. On the older cars, there used to be a filter in here that would break and get jammed in your cylinder head, but luckily we don't have that problem anymore. Next up, we're gonna get the car off the ground. I'm gonna drain the oil so we don't make a giant mess. We'll roll the engine over to TDC and I'll show you exactly what these timing marks look like on this engine because it's a little different than the older ones. Here you can see the blue marks I made on the cam variators. Those are aligned to divots on the teeth of the variator and when we rotate the engine around, those divots line up with two marks on the cam cover. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop the cover off of the lower timing chain cover Cover. Oh, oh, but I caught it. So this is in holding our timing chain tensioner back so that the top side of our chain should have a bunch of slack in it. Next, we're gonna lock our camshafts into place. There's also this tool that fits right in the notch of the variator in case you need to wiggle the camshaft back and forth. But once it lines up, this tool slides in and locks the cam gear. Next, we are gonna sling our engine because we need to remove the engine mount. We should have probably replaced these engine mounts too, but we'll save that. We'll save that for another time. You're doing this. You already got it out. Put a new one on. Now we'll put our holder tool on twist it in to where those two bolts that we just removed mount. That's gonna hold this pulley into place while we take the bolt out. Now we're gonna put this little guy in and it's gonna thread in where our bolt threaded in. You can see these little ridges here and one of them has a big old V. We gotta make sure we line that up so we don't tear up our crank gear. Yay, look at how nice that is. Then I'm gonna take all the bolts out for this lower timing cover, which is a bunch, but there we go. There's our timing. So this is a timing chain tensioner. It's got this big old spring in it. As the chains wear and the guides wear, this gets further out, further out, and further out. If you see five of these rings past this point right here, it's time for that stuff to be replaced. Let's take out one of these guides. Let's get our chain loose. 
Now it's time to actually get to where our valve spring is. We're gonna take our cam bridge out. This thing does a lot, so you need to be mindful of how you take it out. You wanna start on the outside, back and forth, working our way in. Now, your exhaust cam might stick to this cover. That's not a bad thing, because that's how we actually have to take it apart. I'm gonna hold it, look at how I'm holding it. See how I'm holding this exhaust cam? You can see there's sliders for the variable valve lift. If you mess that up, those sliders go poing, and you lose your cam balls. You don't wanna lose your cam balls. We have access to our broken valve valve spring. And we're going to take a little bit of time to inspect this and make sure we don't have any other damage like to the rocker. I don't see any damage to it. It looks okay. This would be a piece that, you know, you could probably make a good case to me that replacing is not a bad idea. So what happens next? Well, that's a great question. First up, I'm going to remove the spark plug. Then what we're going to do is hook the cylinder leak tester up. That's going to push the valve all the way up into its seat. We got 50 PSI coming in, 47 going out. That's probably well within the acceptable range for actual leak down. Then what we can do is install our valve spring compressor tool and remove the valve spring. It's just that easy. It just takes nine years to get there. This comes over, this is so cool. So now we have this piece sitting on the valve retainer and watch this, we just push that down. So we don't have any spring tension. So of course it's super easy to push it down. We're just pushing it down enough to get the keepers out. Here's our retainer. And then here is, oh crap. Here's our broken valve spring. Look at it, it's all twisted in on itself. You can see exactly where it broke. Now the good thing is, is it looks like we have our whole valve spring and there's not chunks of valve spring floating around in our engine, so. Crusty, or old and busted as they say, new hotness. These springs have a top and a bottom. You see these, whatever, five white paint marks? This is the top. So all we have to really do, set that spring in there. We're gonna set our retainer on the top. This is the part that if any part is like a little sketchy, it's this because you just don't want to drop your keeper. <laughs> it's just crazy, like, the actual repair here is, what, two minutes? Actually doing the spring, albeit a little nerve-wracking, but this is probably the easiest part of the job. As you can see, we have a bunch still taken apart and just kind of everywhere, which means it's the perfect time to add another thing to our job. I am going to pull the intake manifold off and do a decarb, and there's a very specific reason why I'm doing it right now. Without our intake cam in, all of our intake valves are definitely closed. Kind of my least favorite way to do a decarb, which is just carb cleaner or brake clean and scrubbing. Media blasting is 100,000 times better, and I think it's probably now time for me to build my own media blasting setup because I don't actually have one. After we clean the intake valves, I'll put the manifold back on, and now it's gonna be time to put our cams back in, put all new chains on, and get this engine timing time, as well as retime our balance shafts. Now, while I was doing that cleaning, I spotted something that might spell disaster for us, and that is some green fuzzy stuff inside the coolant bottle. This means that we have coolant migrating from the coolant level sender up into the wiring harness. I'm gonna deep pin this connector, we'll cut some wires and see how deep it goes, and do a a little hoping and a praying that uh, it's not all the way inside the cabin of the car. The Tiguan's even had a recall on it. All right, now it's time to deal with our cams. I already got the intake cam in and the journals for the cam bearings lubed up. Our exhaust cam though, it's got some special needs that we have to deal with. So here's our cam cover. The purple that's all around here is our anaerobic sealant. Because this has variable valve lift, we have to deal with these sliders. They have to be in a very specific position. If you overslide these sliders, there's a spring and a ball inside each one. I actually think there might be two. You are going to yeet the spring and bork the ball across the the shop and you don't want to be looking for borked balls all over your shop. I also backed the crankshaft back an eighth of a turn to make sure when we tighten this down we don't open a valve into a piston. These bolts are one-time use. Again, don't get the drinking game happening because you're gonna probably die of alcohol poisoning. When we're torquing these things though, just like a cylinder head, start from the middle, and work your way out, that's how you do it. Now we're gonna do our chains, right? So chains are not required for this job, but at 100K, we're right here. Let's just do it anyway. We can take this whole little guy off of here. Maybe, <laughs> get off me. There we go. So on the crankshaft, there's a flat guy. And on this gear, there's a flat guy. I mean, I call this the stupid spot because it's stupid that it's so small. If you don't do this exactly right, what happens is it smashes this to pieces. Be really careful with this. In fact, if you guys want a step-by-step -step timing chain, balance shaft video, we got that engine on the stand. We can do that. Come off me. Old chain. 
new chain. You'll notice that on this chain, the old one, one bit of a link, then one bit of a link, then one and one and one and one. And the new chain is one, then two, then two, then one. These are supposed to be a little bit better wear resistant chains. Oh, this, I got this one all twisted. Okay. <laughs> there, oh, did I, I, all right, I'm gonna fix this. <laughs> We're not gonna tension any of this pretty much until we get them all on. So oil pump chain has to go on. The cool thing is, is it's not timed or anything. Before we go to the top or bring the car down or whatever, we gotta put our balance shaft tensioner on. This guy right here. Now we got two chains like that guy, two chains. Timing marks are uh, deceiving. It's one of those deals where like, if you're looking at the mark and you turn your head this way, or you turn your head this way, it can look like it's out of time. So pocket screwdriver, boom, lay it on there. You can confirm whether you're lined up or not. So there we go. We're lined up at the bottom. We're lined up on the cams. Now we gotta put the guides in. Torque spec is four Newton meters plus 90 degrees. I have a Matco one that goes that low, but it's a giant hunk of crap. Our oil pump is tensioned, yay. Always two revolutions of the crankshaft. That's one full engine cycle. And then we got one more to go down here. With any luck, our blue uppy toppy marks will line up real nice. Okay, we're gonna put that bridge on. I did install these new seals. This is also a piece you wanna be real careful of. It's important to note on the repair manual side, you're supposed to put this cover on first, then release the tensioner for your timing chain. What'll happen if you don't? Your car will explode. If we've learned anything from our friends in the German engineering world, things are done in a way way intentionally. It may be stupid to us plebes that are not the world's bestest engineers, but um, it's, you know, it's supposed to be a certain way, so. I've already cleaned the surface for our pan. Let's get some sealant on that, old girl. Also, be careful with the crank seal. You don't want to booger up your crank seal. I got it. Now, we gotta put our pulley on. We need our special two. You can get this out of time very easily. That's why this tool is nice, because it, I won't say prevents it, but it helps. I'm gonna rotate everybody around one more time. So these are the spool valves going back in. Uh, oh, I gotta get some little bit of engine oil so we can lubricate our seals. Don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but this would be a perfect time to put some new engine mounts in. We have pretty much everything buttoned up, but you may remember a while back, I found that coolant migration issue in the connector through the bottle. We got our new bottle already, but I need to see how bad this migration actually is. So I'm gonna take this connector apart. Actually, a lot of this stuff was really weak. This is a uh, wiper blade modified pin removal tool. Basically, you just bend the metal part of a wiper blade and grind it down to fit the pins if you don't wanna buy the tools because they can be pretty expensive. You can see it goes into this grouping right here. I could probably cut the tape back to just behind the hood strut and not be too bad off. And I'm just gonna look for some corrosion in the connector here. There's a teeny tiny wire. Okay, cool. So we're just gonna have to repin the ends. There's no green fuzzy stuff in the copper. It looks like it's just in the connector. So we caught this early enough that a couple of ends, a couple of wire ends, which I have, a little bit of heat shrink, tapey tapey action, and we're good to go. So the wire here is brown with a blue tracer and it's in number two hole. Number two is brown. Sometimes having the sense of humor of a 14 year old or 12 year old is probably more accurate. Really pays off. It's always better if you can build your wiring harness and crimp the seal down here, but these are pre-made, so we're just gonna do it like that. We'll go ahead and put our connector back together. Remember, the wire for number two is the brown one. Putting a coolant bottle on a VW becomes preventative maintenance or routine maintenance, it seems anyway. And let's get some coolant in this thing. We shouldn't need a ton. I know you guys are all professional oil pourers and you can pour it from 27 feet away and not spill a drop, but uh, I like to just use the funnel. 
not too worried about this kind of stuff because the guy that owns this car is a detailing uh, aficionado. I wouldn't want to deprive him of the enjoyment I know he's gonna get out of detailing this whole thing. That would be a bad friend if I did that. Okay, so I'm gonna go into auto scan like I always do, gateway installation list. What do you mean it's not supported? It's probably not supported because I don't have the dongle plugged in. Now that I have the scan tool actually plugged in, we have 22 faults. Uh, we've had the key on multiple times with a bunch of stuff unplugged. All right, I'm gonna just copy those in case we need them. Then we're gonna clear them. Yes, we'd like to do that. So we still have one code remaining. It looks like some data bus error. I'm not gonna worry too terribly much about that just yet. We're gonna find the test that is something like timing chain lengthening reset after replacing chain. That's what we did, so we're gonna run that one. That's all it does. I think it's just like, hey, ECM, you got a new timing chain. That's it. Now it's the moment of truth. We're going to open the door, fire it up, see what happens. Do a couple key cycles to get our fuel, and let's hope for the best. I would say that's pretty darn good. We got a couple of lights on in the dash, but that's because we had the battery disconnected. I'm showing a couple misfires on cylinder three, only a total count of five. But remember, we did the decarb and all that stuff, so I'm not sweating that. Clearly, it's not misfiring. Okay, so here's what's gonna happen next. I'm gonna let the car warm up. We're gonna get some smoke and stuff out from under the hood, from the oils and stuff on our hands and the oil on the exhaust. Then we're gonna take it on a test drive, make sure everything works and everything's good. Then it's going back to the new owner. While we take it on a test drive, I wanna sum up what happened, the full story that I don't think I told you guys at the beginning because this is a pretty good one. Okay, so the car drives awesome. And you know, whenever you do that kind of stuff, even for me, I've been doing it, you know, for basically ever at this point, there's always a little nerves for me when you go that deep and uh, come out on the other side. So it's good. We're just gonna cruise it around for a bit, make sure it doesn't need anything else. My buddy bought this car for $4,000, which in my opinion, absolute steal for a car that you'd probably be in the eight to 10 to 12 range, given the mileage and the condition. The previous owner brought it to a shop. They said there was engine damage, damage in the cylinder wall, basically led the person to believe they needed an engine. This is why it's so important to make sure you're taking your car somewhere that knows how to properly diagnose cars and doesn't just do one or two tests and pull the trigger on something really, really bad. I mean, an engine for this thing, if you bought it from VW is probably 8,000 bucks. They're so expensive. Luckily, we did our thorough testing and found that it was a $7 part. $7 for that damn valve spring is all it was. We're in it probably about 1600 bucks in parts because of the water pump and all the other stuff that we did. Yet another reason why I tell people, make sure you try and find someone you can trust and rely on to work on your car that knows the car that you own before you need it, before you have some case like this. So with that, I think it's time to wrap this baby up. I'm gonna put some more miles on this GTI. Links to everything we use down in the description, including the Poly-D install option. With that, I'm out, which means you're out too. Have an awesome day. I'll talk to you again next time. I really like Mark 7s. By the way, I'm getting my Mark 7.5 back real soon, and that is a happy chuck.